Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the meeting. Uh, I'm Bruce Sells, uh, and as the new president of the British Society of Soil Science, I am delighted to welcome you all to our fourth Zoom into Soil webinar and our first of 2021. Today's event has been supported by one of our regional groups, the South East England Soil Discussion Group, which is also known as Sea Soil, which is chaired by Leila Froud. Uh, before I welcome our two speakers, I would like to quickly introduce the British, British Society of Soil Science for those who are not so aware of, of who we are and what we do. We are an established international membership organisation and a charity committed to the study of soil in its widest aspects. We bring together those working within academia and have a growing membership amongst practitioners implementing soil science in industry, as well as those with a keen interest in soils. This year, we're going to be running 10 Zoom into Soil webinars, and the next one in the series will be hosted by our Northern Soil Network Group, uh, and that will be on Wednesday, the 3rd of March, on the topic of soil functions, and further information will be distributed after today's event. We're also really hopeful that we'll be able to run our two flagship events for 2021 in person later this year. These will be the Early Career Researchers Conference on Monday the 6th of September at the Radisson Blue in Glasgow and our annual conference and gala dinner which will be on the Tuesday the 7th and Wednesday the 8th of September at the Royal College of Physicians in Glasgow. Both of these events will provide an opportunity to hear from invited speakers from diverse soil science specialisms, see the latest research through oral and poster presentations and also network with colleagues and again we're, you know, we're really hopeful that we can do that in person later this year. So further information on, on participating in both events will be available on our website in the coming weeks. And, and we really do look forward to seeing as many of you there as possible and, and do hope that you'll be able to join us. So just before we uh, start today's presentations, uh, some basic housekeeping. With so many of you here today, all your microphones have been muted. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end of both presentations and Tom is going to monitor uh, those for us. So if you could please submit any questions you've got by 12.50, um, that will hopefully allow us to get through as many of those uh, as we can. Uh, and whilst on the system there is a raise your hand button, we won't be using this unless the, the presenter specific, uh, specifically asks for a show of hands. And today's presentations uh, have also been awarded BASIS and NROSO CPD points. So if you're registered with either of those bodies, please contact us directly after the event. Uh, and finally, uh, just uh, please be aware that we are recording today's presentation. So moving on to today, um, I would first like to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Te uh, Tom Sismer. Tom is an associate professor in environmental chemistry whose research focuses on the biogeochemistry of soils. He leads a research group consisting of PhD students, postdocs and research technicians at the University of Reading who all contribute to the wider vision he has to exploit organic matter and soil biological communities to provide ecosystem functions and services that benefit society. He is the principal investigator of the diverse project which aims to investigate the influence of residues incorporated after growing cover crop mixtures on carbon and nitrogen cycling. Tom's interests particularly relate to the benefit that can be obtained from the incorporation of crop residues and other organic amendments into soils to recycle nutrients and feed soil organisms. Whilst there's widespread acceptance that increasing soil organic matter is a laudable aim and that organic amendments are a tractable means to achieve this aim, the objective of his research is to identify or develop strategies whereby the maximum possible benefits are obtained by the judicious application of situation appropriate amendments. Uh, and so with no, nothing for me, uh, over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, so I'll just share my screen now and hopefully um, uh, you can see it and continue um, uh, with my presentation. So yeah, I'm Tom Sisma. Thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon. Um, to everyone. Um, um, oh, I'm just experiencing a few issues. Um, I think I've got my presentation shared now, uh, so do come back on, Bruce, if it's not, if it's not showing. Um, so I'd just like to say that today's presentation is um, is a collaborative effort, so it's not just um, me, but also um, sort of several members of my uh, research group that have contributed to the stuff that I'm going to uh, share here. Uh, in particular, um, Marika Strauch, um, Shin Shu, and Deddy Anthony, who've kind of contributed um, sort of slides or data that I'm going to 
um, be sharing uh, with you today. And I just wanted to start here with my uh, take home messages um, for uh, today's presentation. And so first of all, I'd just like to say that um, not all soil organic matter is the same. Um, it's not all created equal. And I'll introduce you to, to three different key groups of organic matter within soils. So particulate, organic matter, aggregate bound organic matter and mineral associated um, organic matter. Um, and then I want to introduce you to the concept of carbon use efficiency of the microbial communities in soils and how this can be manipulated in order to increase the amount of organic matter um, that uh, becomes stabilized uh, in soil and, and a few strategies that we might want to employ in order to increase that um, uh, stable organic matter in soil. So applying labile low um, uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio amendments, perhaps mixing um, high and low carbon to nitrogen ratio amendments and growing plants in, in polyculture. So we've got diverse amendments um, going to the soil. Um, and then at the end, I also kind of want to highlight that this is a bit of a journey that we're on um, uh, and that we've still got quite a lot to learn. So I kind of want to share with you some of the sort of things that I'm thinking about at the moment as to how we can then advance um, our knowledge of, of how we might be able to exploit uh, microbial carbon use efficiency um, of our soil microbial communities to help build um, soil organic matter. But first of all, just a, a bit of an introduction um, to soil organic matter. Um, so what it, uh, what it does for us and what benefits we can uh, obtain from it. And there's a number of different ways in which we can um, build soil organic matter in soils by adding organic inputs. So we can add uh, manures, uh, for example, we can add uh, other uh, soil amendments like composts or anaerobic digestates. We can return the residues um, of crops um, into soils. Um, we can grow cover crops in between um, cash crops uh, as a way of, uh, of growing, having more plant material that we can then uh, add into the soil. And also all of these um, crops and plants that we grow in our soils will be releasing uh, root exudate. So that's carbon that's being pumped down um, into the soil um, uh, from the plants. Um, so what, what sort of functions do these, uh, does this organic matter then uh, provide? Well, it's, it's, it's very importantly a food for not just the microbial biomass, but for the entire uh, soil food web, which themselves provide a lot of functions and services. So our soil organic matter helps our soils to retain water uh, and nutrients. It helps benefit our soil structure. And ultimately this, uh, this crummy sort of soil structure that you get um, through these stable aggregates that are stabilized by the presence of the carbon um, helps our soils infiltrate water and helps to, to store water. Ultimately, the benefits to, to, to land managers um, are that we get improved crop yield and quality. Uh, we create soils that are potentially more resilient to extreme uh, weather um, events. Uh, and we also um, are able to grow more crops with reduced uh, inputs. So we're able to increase the efficiency uh, of our inputs. And ultimately, that soil organic matter helps to bind the soil together, preventing erosion and ultimately improving the quality uh, of our water, both because there's less nutrients leaching through the profile and also less soil running off of our fields uh, into rivers. But the thing that I most uh, want to focus mostly on today um, is how does organic matter, so the organic matter that we apply to soils or that enters soils, how does that become soil uh, organic matter? Um, and until about sort of 10 years ago or so, um, the sort of the prevailing belief was that soil organic matter was essentially undecomposed plant material. So plant material that had been entered into the soils, which then um, plays a little bit of a, a game of luck, whereby some of that is decomposed and some of it isn't. And perhaps some of the more recalcitrant compounds were believed to be those uh, things that remain stable in soil for a, a long period of time. Now, over the last sort of approximately 10 um, years that our, our paradigm has shifted. So our understanding of how soil organic matter um, is created in soils has changed a little bit. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of briefly describe the sort of the major processes um, using this diagram here. So I appreciate that this is limited very much to the, um, to the extent of my artwork capabilities, but this over here, this picture of this straw represents kind of all plant litter that might then enter uh, into soils. And what we now know to be true is that the majority, um, the vast majority of that plant litter is decomposed, or I should say is, yeah, is um, 
uh, goes into the microbial community is decomposed by the microbial community and in fact the entire soil food web in a relatively short um, period of time and then again the majority of that carbon that comes in then leaves the system um, as carbon dioxide and occasionally as methane for example um, but then a small amount of that um, carbon is then stored as biomass um, in that microbial community and eventually that microbial community will, will die so microbes will die and those microbes will then become the microbial necromass so the dead microbial uh, community and there that's the stuff that typically gets stored uh, for a long period of time uh, in soils and there's two primary mechanisms that it gets stored so it can become physically protected um, within aggregates so there's an aggregate that physically separates that dead organic matter from the live organic matter that might uh, gobble it up and eat it. Also, it can become chemically protected as well. So it can basically become stuck to a surface of a soil through sorption uh, processes. And because it's stuck to that surface, it's not able to then dissolve into the soil uh, solution and become uh, again ingested by a, a soil microbe. But over time, we do get some desorption and we do get these aggregates um, breaking up. And so some of that um, organic carbon will then become what we call that free um, particulate um, organic matter. And so these three kind of key pools, uh, the physically protected organic matter, the chemically protected organic matter, and that free particulate organic matter um, form the three kind of primary um, pools um, of organic matter uh, in, the, uh, in, in the soil environment. And then the system basically keeps cycling around. So that, that um, organic matter that can become free again comes back to the, um, the soil biological community. And again, we can play that uh, game again, where some of it will be retained in the biomass. Um, much of it will be released as carbon dioxide, but off the bit that is retained in the biomass, that can then become necromass and dead uh, microbial um, uh, matter, which then can become stabilized in the soil um, again. And so the stuff that is really old, the organic matter that's been in the soil for a very long period of time, may have gone round this cycle on multiple um, occasions. And so it's pretty unrecognizable from the stuff that originally um, entered into the soil. Now I'm going to focus a little bit more on these three um, major groups um, uh, or major classifications of, of soil organic matter um, uh, in the soil. And we've got that free particulate organic matter. Um, the organic matter that's protected aggregates um, and the organic matter that's associated um, uh, with minerals. And just by way of analogy, um, I, I would use the analogy of kind of money or finance um, to classify these things. So your free particulate organic matter is a little bit like your, your current account or the money that you might have in your wallet at any given time. So the, the turnover of this free particulate organic matter is pretty rapid. So it doesn't last very long in the soil, it gets gobbled up by um, uh, by microorganisms and other members of the soil um, food web. Um, and as a result, um, uh, we need to keep replenishing this pool of organic matter if we want to build up um, a, a store of it in order to, uh, to perform some of the functions that we want our soils to perform. Um, the organic matter that's um, protected in aggregates, I would maybe use this as a bit of an analogy of your savings account. So this is your um, relatively long-term um, store of carbon um, in the soil, but it's also quite easy to blow your savings account. So if you have a, a, a bit of an issue and you need to um, spend a bit of money quickly, then it's quite easy to lose um, all of that carbon. A mineral associated carbon, I would use as an analogy of like your assets. So this is your long-term um, store of finance. It's actually a, a lot harder to get rid of this um, store of carbon in the soil um, than it is the other two. Um, versions but equally it takes a very long time to build up those assets as well so it takes a very long time to build up that mineral associated uh, organic matter uh, in the soil so what functions do these um, different pools um, uh, deliver so the free particulate organic matter uh, the functions that this is providing is things like nutrient mineralization so this organic matter contains nutrients as well as just carbon uh, and so when it's decomposed, those nutrients are released and made available to plants. It also helps um, with the soils to, to hold water as well. The organic matter that's protected in aggregates, this helps the structure of the soil by generating those stable um, aggregates. 
and the mineral associated organic matter this is where you get that kind of ability for that soil to retain nutrients and prevent them from leaching and also it's our long-term carbon store uh, in soils um, as well but all three of these pools um, are vulnerable to, to greater or lesser extent um, probably the most vulnerable pool is the, the free particulate organic matter, um, but it might be vulnerable to increases in temperature because we know that at higher temperatures, we tend to get higher rates of, of decomposition. Um, our aggregate um, protected pool is vulnerable to tillage. So if we plow up our soils and disrupt those aggregates, then we're making that carbon available um, to, the, to the soil microbial community that can metabolize it. Um, the mineral associated organic matter is much more stable than the other two um, pools, but it might be vulnerable, for example, to things like shifts in pH. So if the pH of the soil changes, then that means that the, the, the soil organic matter can become desorbed from the surface. So for example, land use changes that require large shifts in pH might result in release of some of that um, uh, stable uh, mineral associated organic matter. But one of the key steps that I want to talk about in the um, in the process by which organic matter becomes um, soil organic matter is what happens to this initial resource as it enters into this um, soil microbial community. Um, and ultimately, um, what we can do is we want to be able to increase the amount of that carbon that comes into that microbial community um, and decrease the amount that um, uh, leaves the system as carbon dioxide, because that means we get more dead microbes that then can become that microbial necromass, which ultimately comes our long-term carbon store. And the concept of this, um, uh, this process whereby um, uh, microbes might either um, use that carbon to make their microbial biomass or what we refer to as anabolism um, as uh, against, what, um, against um, using that carbon to respire and use for energy and respiring it as carbon dioxide, which is what we refer to as catabolism. So this, is, this can be kind of embodied within this idea of carbon use efficiency. So this is the amount of carbon that the microbes use to build their biomass divided by the total amount that's being consumed. So the total amount that's entering into the soil. So a soil with a high carbon use efficiency means that we've got a larger soil microbial biomass. And ultimately we hope that then becomes a, a high soil microbial necromass, which can become our long-term stable um, carbon store. So ultimately what I'll talk about today is ways in which we can increase soil carbon use um, efficiency. And it's worth mentioning that compared to a few other different um, environments, so marine, estuarine, uh, coastal uh, environments, that the soil carbon use efficiency um, is much higher than we see and we observe in other uh, types uh, of environments. But at the same time, the range of carbon use efficiencies that our soil microbial communities can exhibit is also quite broad um, as well. So we might have some soils that are operating at the very low end of this range, where most of that carbon is being released as CO2. And we may have other soils that are operating with a very high carbon use efficiency, where most of that carbon is going into the microbial biomass. Uh, and some of the key uh, things that can influence um, uh, the extent to which we have a high carbon use efficiency uh, is the uh, is the investment of those microbes need to make in acquiring um, their resources. So um, carb the amount the the type of carbon amendment that we add into the soil, the quality of that substrate, and the nutrients that are available um, dictate the carbon use efficiency. So larger, more recalcitrant mod, uh, molecules with a high carbon to nitrogen ratio, they typically have a low carbon use efficiency. And these kind of remind me of the squirrel from the Ice Age um, movies. So if you've not seen the movie, the squirrel kind of uh, pops up every 10 or 15 minutes and he spends lots of energy chasing around this uh, acorn. Uh, and by the end of the, uh, the movie, um, you kind of wonder whether the squirrel has spent more of its energy trying to get this acorn than it would actually uh, gain from um, from actually eating it. Uh, and by way of analogy, this might um, represent sort of straw um, or so something with a high lignin content, not very much nitrogen that would be very difficult for the soil microorganisms to break down. On the flip side, we could have low uh, molecular weight compounds, so simple sugars that have perhaps a high C to N ratio and a much higher carbon use efficiency. 
Um, so again, using an analogy, this might be simpler to similar to Augustus Gloop from the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory uh, movie. So Augustus Gloop's a big fan of chocolates and sweets and things. Uh, and of course, he's very fat as, as well as a result. So this is kind of what we want our microbial communities to be. We want them to be fat, we want them to become larger, we want them to use that carbon uh, to build um, biomass. And these um, simple sugars might be com coming from plant root exudates, for example, these sugars that the plant root is pumping into the, um, uh, into the soil. Uh, of course, the plant root exudates typically don't contain much nitrogen, so, um, so nitrogen is also required by that community um, in order to build soil organic matter. So, so what we add into the soil can have an influence on in the carbon use efficiency. I also want to share this concept here, um, which is um, uh, published by Cynthia Kallenbach um, and, and co-authors um, two years ago now. Um, it's a really neat paper, basically explains um, that each individual microbial community will have its own window of carbon use efficiency that it operates within. And so you can change the environmental conditions in order to change the carbon use efficiency of the pre-existing microbial community. But at the same time, um, you can also shift the population of the microbial community that you have um, in your uh, soil uh, to one that might operate at a higher carbon use efficiency. And what was proposed in this paper, I should say the data that's being presented on the screen here, um, is that you might be able to, uh, on one side, you could have sort of a high C2N ratio material or a low C2N ratio material. But there are benefits to be um, gamed by mixing high and low C2N ratio materials in order to optimize the carbon use efficiency and ultimately result in more carbon going into the microbial biomass and a little bit less leaving the system as carbon dioxide. Uh, we tried this um, in a field experiment, so we mixed some, some low C2N ratio um, compost, some vegetable waste compost with some high C2N ratio materials like wood chips um, or straws. Uh, and we did an experiment where we looked at the, um, uh, the mixture um, uh, versus the sum of the parts. Uh, and then we plotted, we measured a whole bunch of different things uh, and plotted them on this graph. And if they appear on the right hand side of the graph, this means that the mixture is greater than the sum of the parts. If they appear on the left-hand side of this graph, then the mixture is less than the sum of the parts. Uh, and one of the things we measured was soil organic matter, uh, and we found that uh, the soil organic matter that we uh, built in that soil was greater, that, uh, was greater than the sum of the parts when we applied that high and low C to N ratio mixture uh, together. So this got us thinking a bit more about um, diversity and whether it matters, whether we had a more diverse um, mixture of substrates um, into our soils. Um, and here we did a much more controlled experiment um, in the laboratory. So it was a very small uh, pot scale experiment. And to every treatment, we added the same amount of carbon. And we either added that carbon uh, in the form of the residues of a, in a single crop, or we added that carbon in the, in the residues of a mixture of four uh, different um, crops. And the crops we used here were typical cover crops that farmers might grow in between two uh, cash crops in a cereal rotation. So we have sunflower, um, we have radish, we have clover, um, and we have um, buckwheat. And so we then compared, um, uh, similar to the last experiment, we compared um, what happens when you av uh, add the mixture versus the, uh, the average uh, of the sum of the parts. And what we were looking at was the soil microbial biomass, which we measured using a technique uh, referred to as PLFA or phospholipid fatty acid analysis. And here we can see our, our orange or pink bar is higher than our, um, our turquoise bar. And what this means is that when we mix um, those four uh, residues together, we get uh, more of that plant derived carbon going into the microbial biomass. We also looked at the extent to which adding these plant residues primed the decomposition of the soil organic matter that was already um, in the soil, and we saw no difference. Whereas all these treatments did prime soil organic matter, we didn't see any difference between um, the, um, the mixture and the sum of the parts. We also looked at which microbial communities were responsible for this uh, difference that we observed here, and we saw that the gram-positive um, bacteria and our fungi communities uh, were primarily responsible for this difference. And this is consistent with the idea that our gram-positive microbes and our fungal, fungal communities um, are a little bit, they tend to have a higher carbon use 
uh, efficiency uh, anyway. So we think to some extent that there are some benefits to be obtained um, by mixing plant residues as they go into the soil. So just to summarize on, on carbon use efficiency, um, so there's kind of three primary um, techniques that I'm introducing that we might be able to use to increase the carbon use efficiency uh, of our amendments. Um, we can either apply a sort of labile low C to N ratio um, amendments, so those simple sugars that feed things like Augustus gloop, or we can mix some of our high and low C to N ratio uh, amendments, accepting the fact that you know, we have these amendments like straw, perhaps we can still use them. Uh, and also there seems to be some benefits by growing plants in polycultures, so we've got a mixture of diverse substrates um, entering into our soil. So just to um, just to end by thinking a little bit more about the future and to sort of um, share some ideas, I'll be um, very happy for people to use the, the chat box to let them know what they think of these sort of ideas. But I'm starting to think about, so what do these microbial communities that have got a high carbon use efficiency look like? Well, we think they probably have a higher fungal to bacterial ratio, usually. We've, they tend to have more sort of what we call K-strategists. So these are... Um, uh, a little bit like using the analogy of the, the hare and the tortoise, so uh, the, the, the tortoise is more like a K strategist and an R strategist would be more like the hare, so they're slightly slower um, growing. Um, and just broadly speaking, we're looking for species that invest more of their energy in dispersal or facilitation, cooperation, a little bit less in competition or tolerating stress or acquiring their resources. So we could think about things like how we um, promote biofilm formation in soils. Do we provide sort of porous materials, perhaps biochar, zeolites, that kind of thing, surfaces which might help the creation of biofilms because we know that biofilms have a slightly higher carbon use efficiency. Um, do we need to select or breed plant communities that might produce these exudates with a high carbon use efficiency? Um, or are there things that we could sort of do to the soil amendments before we add them to the soil? So, for example, might we ferment them or do some other process in which we convert that carbon into a form that might then have a, um, a higher carbon use efficiency? And I guess just a shout out that if you're if you're looking to sort of things a bit of further reading on this as well, this is a fantastic paper um, published almost a, a, a year ago now by um, some, some authors in Switzerland, um, which kind of talks through this this, this idea about. Um, how we can use soil microbial communities. And there's a few ideas, including some on this slide that have come, have come from this paper uh, as well. So I'll just end with my take home messages. So again, that those, those three different key types of organic matter in the soil, the particulate bound, aggregate bound and mineral associated. Um, uh, there are strategies that we can adopt to increase the carbon use efficiency um, of the soil organic matter that we add into our soil. Uh, and of course, there's a lot more um, that we can learn and there's a lot more research that needs to be um, done in the future in order to uh, advance our understanding. Um, so with that, I'll just share my um, acknowledgements, um, particularly um, Marika Strauch, Shin Chu and, uh, and Deddy Anthony, but also a, a whole bunch of funders and organisations um, that we um, work with. Uh, of course, I will thank you uh, for listening. Um, and now I'll hand over uh, to Bruce, who I think will uh, will introduce Julian uh, for his presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. That was excellent. Um, and just a reminder, we will be taking um, questions for both speakers at the end of the, the session. So our next speaker is Julian Gold. Uh, Julian is a farmer's son and graduated from Harpercut Adams College with a HND in agriculture. After a short spell on the family farm, he spent the last 33 years managing farms and estates, initially with uh, farm management companies involving short periods on different farms, and latterly a longer tenure on a privately owned estate. Julian is a, a facts and basis trained agronomist and has a commitment to continuing to improve cropping performance, but in a sustainable manner. In 2012, he implemented a 10 meter control traffic system across the estate, which has given a leap forward in, in soil health management. Uh, he carries out regular field trials in-house and for external organizations. And he is presently in year three of a five year assist trial, which is a major government funded trial to investigate integrated management systems as a way of delivering sustainable intensification. He was one of the first tranche of AHDB to monitor farms from 2014 to 2017 for the Farmer to Farmer Knowledge Exchange Programme. 
Julian is on the Sea Soil Committee uh, and is keen to help improve the flow of knowledge between farmers and the scientific community. Uh, and he was awarded the Soil Farmer of the Year in 2019. So over to you, Julian. Thanks, Bruce. Just going to show my screen. Right, I cannot see or um, see anything on the screen other than my presentation, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Could somebody just confirm? Yeah, we can hear you, Julian. Okay, thank you. Um, right, yes, um, building on Tom's talk, I really just want to whiz through and show you what this building and maintaining soil organic matter looks like on farm in practice and some of the problems. Now, this is a very um, site specific talk because on Hendred Estate, we haven't got any organic amendments really going into the system. We're predominantly a, a cropping farm with a few sheep on permanent pasture and cover crops. Um, so we're trying to build organic matter without rotational lays and without a lot of organic amendments like FYM M and compost. Um, so that makes it a little bit harder for us, but we are achieving quite good results. I think hopefully you'll see. Um, just thinking about, as a farmer, just thinking about soil organic matter, um, that's obviously the big dilemma, soil organic matter, do you hoard it or use it? Well, as a farmer, I want to build soil organic matter in my soil for long-term soil health and um, sustainability, but I also want organic matter to be cycling in the system. I want, I don't want to be relying on all my nutrition from artificial fertilizer sources. I want to be mineralizing organic matter and providing nutrients for crops um, to obviously help with our economic yield of crops. So it's trying to achieve this happy medium of building soil organic matter, but also using soil organic matter. Um, and you'll see how we try to do that as I go through the talk. Um, this is a slide that I will um, go back to a few times. Basically, this, this summarizes on Hendred Estate how we're trying to build healthy soil in our system. And obviously, healthy soil, you're talking good structure on the left-hand side, and you're talking about building soil organic matter on the right-hand side. And I've got my little techniques in the blue and red boxes that I'm going to talk about through the talk as to how we're achieving this. Um, also in the middle, you'll see the sort of little one in brackets, trying to increase the fungal bacterial ratio in the soil. Um, I'm very aware that in intensively farmed systems such as ours, it's a, our dominant ratio is bacterial to fungal is higher higher bacterial than fungal but obviously we've got lots of advantages with increasing fungal numbers you've got things like mycorrhizal associations that are improving crop yields um, you've got things like better carbon use efficiency as tom pointed out with fungi rather than bacteria and you've got just the fungal fungi's ability to improve soil aggregation and carbon stability in the soil so I've got that one in the middle in brackets. It's one that I've constantly got in the back of my mind, but I think in practice, it's very difficult to influence easily in a commercial farming situation. But just going through all the others one by one, starting with the photosynthesis on the right-hand side. Um, yeah, I really see myself not as a farmer, I see myself as a photosynthesis facilitator. Um, and a bit like a method actor, I like to sort of get myself in role for what I'm trying to achieve on the farm. And I like to sort of try and imagine this sort of fantasy of this intelligent soil ecosystem and it's sort of employing crops to grow in it, to feed the ecosystem with carbon. And it's employing me to tend the crops. And for my um, work, they're sort of giving me the grains as a reward for tending the crops. Um, and that's my sort of fairly naive way of just sort of thinking about how I'm managing my farm and my cropping system looked at another way um, and using some of Tom's analogies with the squirrel and Augustus Gloop um, you've got the crops growing in the soil system there with me concentrating on feeding the soil system and I think that and taking the grains as wages and I think that it's interesting that the actual end result by me concentrating on working for the soil system rather than working for a big crop yield it gives me a big crop yield as a side, um, as a sort of result of getting a healthy soil and working on looking after the soil ecosystem 
I, I naturally get big yields of grains. And so it's just a sort of different emphasis, but it gives you a better, the same or better end result as concentrating on maximizing your crop yield. Um, and then you've got everything going back into the soil system, the carbon in the straw, and you'll see through the talk that this is a big issue that's caused us a lot of problems over the years because I've sort of had this fixation on this lower carbon use efficiency straw and getting that back into the soil system. Whereas I'm over the years, I think I've probably been detrimental to some of the better carbon use efficiency things like root exudates um, going into the system, but we'll, we'll see that as we go through. Um, so thinking about photosynthesis, obviously one of the main things with photosynthesis, is we need to max out our utilization of solar radiation. And that's just a graph sort of teaching grandma to suck eggs, more sunshine in the summer. And obviously with our cash crops, as sunshine's building through the spring and early summer, we're maximizing the photosynthesis and the biomass yield by judicious use of inputs and um, trying to grow the crops as efficiently as we can. Um, to maximise the yield and maximise root exudates and crop biomass going back into the system. But then I think the trick is in building soil organic matter is sort of sneaking in those extra bits of phot photosynthesis. The big thing for me is this July, August, early September period where you've got a lot of solar radiation and traditionally you've got no um, crops in the system. So this is where your cover crops and your catch crops um, come in. Traditionally, obviously, that's the sort of scenario you might have seen on farms between summer harvested crops and spring planted crops, bare stubbles, even ploughed cultivated fields with nothing growing on them. Um, bit of a missed trick really, missing out on photosynthesis. So we're putting cover crops in um, the, wherever we can. And the other thing about cover crops and thinking about maxing out that solar radiation, we need to get the crops in the ground and growing. The, the drill needs to be in the field with the combine harvester. This is last year um, the field on the right drilled um, on the 4th of August on the left exactly the same mix on the same soil type into the same scenario of chopped wheat straw drilled nearly a month later their photos in October the one on the right is up around your waist and the one on the left is barely taller than the stubble so again if we're going to utilize this radiation in the summer we need to get the crops in the ground and growing um, the other thing obviously is catch crops between, um, as well as cover crops between summer harvested crops and spring crops is whether you can get catch crops in between summer harvested crops and winter planted crops. And people try to do this in the UK. We don't try, I think it's too difficult. Um, people put mustard crops in and quick growing crops and try and get a bit of a crop growing there. But I, I think it's quite, it's quite difficult in UK conditions. Um, Cover crops early on tended to be about two or three things in the mix. High biomass, we're aiming for high biomass cover crops and then grazing them off with sheep. As the years have gone by, the mix has got more diverse and more intricate. Um, that was last year's cover crop mix. Many more legumes in the mix now and less cereals, um, various reasons um, for mixtures. We want a diversity of root systems, obviously exploring the soil profile. Um, You've got different microbial associations um, with the different plants. Um, and so as Tom was pointing out in his talk, you've potentially got better community um, carbon use efficiency from the different plants. You've also got a range of CN ratios, which is giving you, again, a better community carbon use efficiency. It's all about getting diversity into the rhizosphere and into the soil. Um, and just while we're on mixtures and diversity with our cash crops as well, we're playing around trying to maximize infield diversity. And for the last few years, been playing around with understories, companion cropping. Um, the ultimate one in the bottom right hand corner, agroforestry, is one of my pet favorites that we haven't really got around to um, doing yet, but hopefully sometime in the future. Um, right, going back to my main slide, now to talk a bit about returning crop residues. This is something that over the years, um, as I alluded to, alluded to earlier on, I've spent a lot of effort on returning crop residues, and I think a lot of it has been sort of misguided, really. And a lot of the problems it's caused us have probably been detrimental to our overall soil organic matter improvements. Um, obviously, you've got a range of outcomes with um, crop residues. Sort of one extreme here is your high CN ratio cereal straws left on the surface, um, and your subsequent crop. We've got oilseed rate there. 
direct drilled, you've got a fungal dominated residue decomposition there. And these are the situations where obviously you're hoping the net end result into the soil system is the best, but that gives us the most problems in establishing following crops. You've got another extreme here where you might grow low CN ratio crops like beans and to an extent also rape. Um, if their residues are soil incorporated, you're sort of tending to err uh, towards a bacterial dominated residue decomposition, um, not quite so beneficial in the soil system. Um, we find that these all seed rape and bean residues, in practice, we, we don't incorporate them, they're just left on the surface, the same as the cereal ones, but they give us very little um, problem with establishing following crops, mainly because it's cereals after them. Um, but obviously, you haven't got problems with residue decomposition because of the low CN ratio, they break down much more quickly and don't tie up nitrogen. Um, just going back to cereal and just whizzing through a few slides showing the problems over the years. Chopping winter barley straw there a few years ago. Um, you can see down the left hand side, I don't know if you can see my pointer, we left a straw swath and baled it and subsequently direct drilled all seed rape. That's the all seed rape establishment over the whole field. That's actually after we re-drilled it. The first establishment was really poor and then we drilled it for a second time. That's the area in the field that we baled the straw swath. So you can see we ended up with a crop on the bulk of the field, which was a bit half, at half mast, um, compared to the fantastic crop where we took the straw off. And you do have to ask yourself the question, you know, this, this crop where the straw came off, you've got big, high biomass crop, big root systems, good photosynthetic um, exudates going down into the soil. Um, and you do wonder if you shot yourself in the foot a bit because you've, fair enough, you've incorporated the straw on the bulk of the field, but actually have you ended up with less organic matter in the system, um, could have sold the straw and ended up with a nicely established crop of rape. The end result actually was very um, satisfactory. The whole field averaged nearly five tonne to the hectare, but you can see the bale strip down that left-hand side where I've got the two red lines to mark it. If you look across on the legend, that bit yielded well over 5.5 tonne to the hectare. So there was a significant yield increase. Um, other issues here, direct drilling a spring cover crop, a cover crop mix into chopped spring barley straw, um, basically wasted my money on the expensive seeds in the mix because only the mustard grew. Um, everything else failed. It's, it's too harsh an environment. We, we found over the years to try and plant things into the spring barley straw. It's such a mass of straw breaking down. Um, uh, 2016, we had to drill this field twice. Um, first attempt lost to slugs and snails. Um, all seed rape last year, direct drilled after chopped winter barley straw. Again, slugs have ravaged it. Um, over the years, we've learned to cope with these straw residues. So this was in 2018, drilling all seed rape. That was the resulting crop in mid-November. The only issues in that field, just two strips down in the middle of the field, where we were combining the winter barley, we uh, combined too late in the evening and the chop quality deteriorated. Um, where we have poor chop quality, we find real issues with establishing rape. Um, but generally, we're, we're, we're coping with these high straw loadings now. We're doing lots of multiple rolling passes to ensure soil to seed contact. And I think as my soil system gets used to a big, load of high CN ratios going back in the whole time. It's just gobbling up the residues uh, more quickly and easier than it did in the past. Um, obviously, the other thing with a lot of high CN ratios, uh, residues on the surface is they're really good worm food. So um, I'm feeding my nice deep burrowing earthworms and we see all over the farm earth, uh, earthworm middens everywhere. And they're basically doing the incorporation for me. Um, right. Next one quickly, um, looking at both sides of the equation here, or building organic matter and structure. On the structure side, the minimizing compaction and not cultivating, um, that's where controlled traffic feeds in and also not oxidizing the carbon that we've sequestered. So this is how we do our controlled traffic system. First of all, if you just think about where farm machinery has gone, 40, 50 years ago, you might have a tractor and drill, two or three turned down in the left-hand corner, a little old gray Fergie, um, nowadays, you're talking 20 or 30 ton for an outfit, and fair enough, they're on white tracks. The ground pressure is low on the surface, but it's the overall axle weight acting down on the soil is still a big problem. You know, imagine a flimsy sleeper bridge over a dike in the fens. 
I know which one I'd rather drive over the um, fragile bridge. And it's just thinking about the, the big axle loadings on the soil. What we used to do on Hendred Estate is basically like a lot of other people, multiple width implements drive in different directions all over the field. So we were trafficking 80% of the soil surface. Now we've got everything set 10 metres wide on multiples of 10, um, 30 metre tram line widths. And we've turned our trafficking on its head. Instead of trafficking 80%, we're trafficking 20%. Um, this is what it looks like in the field. That's a neighbour's farm after harvest. So uh, lots of compaction damage randomly all over the field. They've got to cultivate to alleviate that, obviously letting um, carbon out of the system in the process um, and damaging fungal networks and all the other problems with cultivation. Our system next door, basically 80% of it untouched. And where we have got, if you can see my pointer there, um, between every 30 metre tram lines, there's a couple of infills where we're trying to grow crops if they're compacted we can just run down with a two-leg subsoiler and just alleviate that compaction without touching most of the soil surface um, and that's what it looks like in practice vehicles all sort of using the same set of wheelings that's drilling a cover crop type behind the, the combine basically the drills chasing the combine out of the field um, the last big topic uh, nearly finished now um, this is one that I'm sort of increasingly, we could talk about this for hours, but I've only got a few minutes. I'm increasingly motivated by this optimization of synthetic N to maximize the building and retention of soil organic matter. If we think about it, N is, it's N, N's the elephant in the room really, that people don't really talk about that much in, in relation to soil organic matter. And it's, it's a good guy and it's a bad guy. If you think about it, judicious use of synthetic N one side of the um, balance, it's fantastic. You're increasing crop growth, photosynthesis, biomass, building soil organic matter. And I think that's where, in a lot of ways, um, conventional farmers can hold their heads up high compared to organic farmers because we are growing 12 tonne crops of wheat instead of four tonne crops of wheat. And we are putting more carbon into the soils with um, judicious use of N. So it's good. But then if you tilt the scale too far the other way and go into excessive use of synthetic N, you start to get lots of problems. Um, obviously, if there's a lot of synthetic N in the system, soil system, and the soil biology is looking for carbon uh, to balance up the CN ratio, the only way it can really get it is start eating soil organic matter, and then we start to get carbon losses into the atmosphere. Uh, we get the other, and the soil organic matter is ultimately re reducing. We also got problems with nitrate leaching, ammonia emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, which th th they're all big problems with excess nitrogen, but we can't really go into those. So I think really there's a new paradigm with um, soil nitrogen, uh, with, sorry, synthetic nitrogen. I mean, in the old days, farmers were, were sort of always talking about optimizing synthetic end use to maximize economic yield. But I think if we're really serious about climate change and maximizing soil organic matter, we really need to think about um, optimizing synthetic N for maximizing organic matter accumulation in soils, which is a slightly different level of synthetic N, which would be much lower down the scale. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done on this concept. Um, just two little side points to do with N. Um, there's lots of things to talk about N, and it's all about increasing N use efficiency, which we try and do in lots of ways on the farm. But two other little side points, which I think are quite interesting. Um, I often think about this concept, if you put in a balanced CN ratio material into soil, like a, a compost, a nice balanced compost amendment, I often think that the soil biology just sort of thinks, oh, Mr. Farmer's basically just added soil to soil. There's nothing for us to do, boys. We'll just roll over and go back to sleep. But when I'm putting a big load of high CN ratio straw into the system, and if I'm putting synthetic N with it as well, the, obviously the soil biology has got to wake up to digest that um, straw. And obviously it'll utilize the synthetic N to equalize the CN ratio. So you're turning synthetic N into organic N in the bodies of the soil uh, organisms. And obviously, eventually, these are rotting down and it's becoming organic N that becomes slowly available to crops. But in the meantime, you're, you're sort of locking up synthetic N, stopping it leaching over winter and turning it into a, a much better format. And the whole thing, I always think, is maybe stimulating, as long as you've got enough soil biology there, stimulating it to all work rather than just putting something that's nicely, nicely balanced into the system. Just a thought. Um, the other thing with nearly finished now, I've got very two quick slides um limiting synthetic end use we're sort of on the farm we're trying to integrate legumes within the cropping situation 
and obviously this has got lots of benefits because it's also balancing CN ratios in the system um, and improving sort of nitrogen lockup situations and improving the sort of overall carbon use efficiency and, and also increasing the infill biodiversity as I spoke about earlier and getting diverse rise effort spheres in the system. Um, so companion cropping um, works with oilseed rape. It's very difficult. We've tried to take it to harvest with beans and oats. Very difficult to harvest and very difficult to separate them. So it's work in progress. This sort of clover understory is more interesting. And again, two last quick points. Um, playing around with a, either an annual or a permanent clover understory and planting crops, annual crops into it. The permanent one we found doesn't work very well. It's very, very difficult because the clover gets too established and it outcompetes the annual crop. But I think, for example, planting a clover understory with the spring barley, and then when you harvest the spring barley, you've already got living green material to harvest that solar radiation in August and September is a useful concept that we're playing around with. And also, the other idea is putting a non-cereal legume-based cover crop in in the autumn and selectively spraying out the cereal and black grass out of the system and then direct drilling the spring barley into the living cover crop rather than eating it with sheep or spraying it off the ground up and then leaving that in the spring barley crop as long as you can probably late April early May and spraying it out with a selective herbicide and that way you've got you've had this um, legume cover crop in the system growing under the spring barley and you've got this low CN ratio cover crop rotting down and it's not locking up um, nitrogen uh, for the growing barley crop and getting assimilated quickly I think I better leave my last two slides other than just two quick comments. Over the years, we're, build, we're building soil organic matter, I reckon, over 20 years at a rate of about 0.13% per year. So it's not a quick process and we're not matching the 4 per thousand initiative yet. But remember, we're not got the rotational lays in the system and we've not got organic amendments. And the last slide was just a point on be careful of soil organic matter testing uh, one in the red oval, one sample effectively to three labs and four different soil tests a range of 2.1 percent a more interesting thing is the green oval which is um, a soil sample from a field and a soil sample from under the hedge next door to it sent to the same lab on the same day with the same test so it shows me what i'm trying to achieve in the field i've got a sort of natural soil organic matter of 7.7 .7 under the hedge but i'm managing to achieve six in the field where i've got a cropping system going on thanks <coughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Julian. Some great insights there into the sort of the practical application uh, of the science and, and some great questions that you posed as well, I think. Um, so Tom's been monitoring the questions. Can I hand over to yourself, Tom, to try and get through as many as we can? Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a few minutes to get through some questions. I've tried to type some answers to, to individual questions as well. Um, I'll give Julian a break and answer one myself and then I'll, I'll hand one to, to Julian. Um, but uh, Israel asks, um, can you differentiate between the microbial necromass and the microbial biomass uh, in the soil? Uh, are there methods to separate them? So, so yeah, there's some quite long, um, long-standing methods that we can use to um, to measure microbial biomass. So, typically, we extract the soil with um, uh, with a salt solution, um, and we can do that with by splitting the soil into two halves. And one half we would fumigate with with chloroform first to kill all the microbial biomass and that releases all their carbon and that differentiates the living versus uh, the dead uh, microbial community um, in the soil. Um, I can hand one over to, to, to Julian I think so there's a question here um, about whether returning crop residues into the soil causes pest issues such as slugs so do you see these issues Julian and what might you do to resolve them? Yeah, I mean, as you saw in some of those pictures, uh, slugs have been a massive issue over the years for us. Massive issue. Um, a bit of raking helps. Physical degradation of slugs and slug eggs really helps well in the summer. So we, we sometimes rake if we have to. We've got a 10 metre rake that we can use. Um, we roll lots post-establishment, which um, helps consolidate. Again, helps uh, with physical slug control. We've used a relatively large amount over the years of slug pellets. I hasten to add we're using ferric phosphate, we have been for years, rather than metaldehyde, which is kind to the soil ecosystem. Um, but also I think the predators, the natural predators, the carabid beetles are building up in our systems. We're trying to, something I haven't gone into in this talk, but we're trying to put um, six metre wildflower strips 
in amongst our cropping actually down the middle of our fields as well to give hosts the beneficials and we're seeing benefits from that in slugs in uh, chop straw situations so yeah it's getting better and better all the time but in the early years very problematic okay uh thanks very much julian i can see there's a, there's a few other questions um i might uh go through as well so uh, so Gary asked a question um, uh, saying that what I said was that all of the stable carbon in the soil is microbial necromass, but he, he points out that is this also the case with sort of really recalcitrant carbon like um, hardwood tree um, wood pieces? Um, so I, I would say that yes, even in forest systems, the, the long term organic, manic, organic carbon in soil has still broken down. Is that uh, even those woody materials? Um, uh, break down. So when we look at the average age of soil organic matter, sometimes it comes back as being thousands of years old. That isn't the original plant material that's that, that, that's hung around. Um, however, in your comment, you would also sort of mention the word waterlogging as well. And I guess it's a it's just worth mentioning that um, in in this talk, I'm mostly talking about um, sort of aerobic soils. So there's a lot of generalizations you have to uh, make. Of course, we have very different ways in which carbon is uh, is stored, for example, in peatlands, where that is indeed um, undecomposed um, plant material. Um, I, I do want to address a, a really good question by Rebecca here, who's asked how how might we encourage mineral associated organic matter instead of our organic aggregate or our particulate bound stuff? This is a, a fantastic question. It's a bit of a grand challenge, I think, as well. And there's um, there's, there's, I think there's very few sort of solutions um, to how we might do this, but there's some sort of off the wall ideas kind of thing. So we might be able to to make amendments to our soils um, of the minerals that we know that organic matter uh, adsorbs to. We might even be able to um, to bind those minerals onto um, surfaces that are very porous. Uh, so things like iron oxides and things like that. So there's, I think there's a a lot of um, a lot of things that we can try kind of thing, but I don't think there's any off the shelf sort of uh, methods for doing that um, uh, just yet. Um, one for Julian, I think, uh, and then we might make this the last one or the penultimate one, um, spraying with herbicide. So is there a is there a solution um, to, 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 I think, growing cover crops while avoiding spraying herbicides? incredibly difficult in particularly if you've got blackgrass in the situation um incredibly difficult um i think ultimately if roundup dis glyphosate dis disappears from the system we will need to think about rotational plowing coming back into farming systems um to maybe get rid of cover crop biomass um it's and i don't think a lot of people a lot of no-tillers and regen ag farmers sort of view the plough as a devil's tool and I think if we've got a rotation that's majoring on building soil organic matter and doing everything else it possibly can I don't think ploughing very occasionally is really the end of the world I mean there's plenty of experiments actually all ploughing's actually doing is just redepositing re organic matter lower down the profile and actually it's not as bad as people think oxidizing organic matter but I think it's just farming's a compromise and a herb, the herbicides, we're tending to use herbicides at the moment, but if we can't use herbicides, we've got to think of other ways of doing things. Thank you, Julian. Um, I'm just gonna answer one final question where someone highlights biochar as well. It's something I haven't talked about, but yeah, biochar is pyrolyzed organic carbon. So it is recalcitrant uh, to decomposition. Honestly, I think if we're trying to um, solve the climate change problem and store carbon in soils for long-term, that I think the only real viable way that we're going to be able to do that in the kind of quantities that makes a really big um, uh, dent in the problem is, is is using something like biochar. But at this point, I think we're rapidly approaching one o'clock. So I think I need to hand over to Bruce to, to say goodbye to you. And thanks for all for, for participating. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, so yeah, just finally, on behalf of the, the British Society of Soil Science, I, I would 
uh, like to express our thanks to Tom and Julian for coming along to present today uh, and to Leila Froud for, for coordinating CSOIL support. I think it's been another great session with some, some great insights and, and as ever more questions posed. Um, so thank you all for attending. Uh, when you leave you'll find a quick survey a quick feedback survey um, which I hope you'll take time to complete and the recording of this video will be available after this event on our YouTube channel for you to watch again. Uh, so yes finally please keep an eye out on our website for forthcoming events and, and we really do look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday the 3rd of March uh, for Zoom into Soil um, about soil functions uh, which is now open for registration uh, and so with that thank you again and goodbye. <laughs>